Assalamu alaikum and thank you very much for turning out the Sunday morning to for the regional security conference. It's not a very popular topic for the participants to turn out to participate in a Sunday morning, but nevertheless, despite the early morning uh, Sunday, we have a quite good group of the people here. So now we will be starting in a very uh, short period. Actually, this is not the first day of the conference for the one that is new coming. This is the third day of the conference. The first two days we had uh, closed sessions and now we are having the open ones. In the closed session, we try to generate as much intellectually in-depth knowledge as possible. And we found actually one thing that was very striking, particularly when you try to push the people in the closed sessions. It was that, well, as it is the case in most of the region, the analysis of the history, the analysis of the troubles, the analysis of the problems attracts a significant amount of the uh, attention. People are very much in favor and very much in love with discussing the past, the discussing the problems, discussing the troubles, and how, ba how bad the things are. But when we push the people to go beyond how the bad the things are and how we can come out of it, unfortunately there, there was like some form of the confusion or some form of the withdrawal. And this also reflected the state of the being in the regions. The analysis of the issues, the analysis of the past, because the history becomes, in a sense, a prisoner, a, a very comfortable prison for most of the people in the region in which they can take the refugees. So we hope that this platform, which is right now the third year that we are running is the, towards a new regional security, towards new regional security arrangements. Last year it was the architectures, but we changed the word architecture to arrangement for a purpose because the architecture referred to one single form. When we say like arrangements, we talk about like multiplicity of the, or the multiplicity of the forms that these regional security arrangements can take place. And this is like, you know, open to new debates and is open to new uh, inputs as well too. So here is, this year is the third one. The first year it was focused on the violent extremism because back then the issue of the violent extremism was quite popular in, on the international agenda, but the trouble is the discussion of it was very much reductionist. It was reduced to the war on terror. It was not treated as a political issue. It was not treated as a social issue. It was not treated as a you know, re crisis of the regional order, regional state, the crisis of the regional states. Rather, it was reduced to a war on terror, and even, and even the formula that was offered to, do, to deal with this issue was quite reductionist and quite actually short-sighted. So the first year we started to deal with this issue from all angles. Last year, as, we, as I said, the title was Towards a New Regional Security Orders. When we choose this title, as we did these years, we are not delusional. We are not you know, detached from the reality of today. We, do, we know that the regional security architecture will not emerge tomorrow. We know that a regional security arrangements will not emerge uh, tomorrow or next year or even two years from now. But, the, but we need to change the narrative. We need to change the discourse. We need to change like, you know, the, how we think about the regions. Are we going to just talk about the region in terms of the crisis? Because whenever there is a conference on the region, it's either you know, it either includes the word crisis or the chaos. And when everything is so crisis and chaos centric, and unfortunately it turns into a vicious cycle in which the crisis and the chaos discourse start to like, you know, regenerate in itself in different contexts. So here, let's change the focus a bit without being, you know, completely unrealistic, without being completely detached from the reality of today, but let's focus on how we can get out of this uh, what we call the regional crisis or collapse or chaos. So the, this was the major idea behind the selection of the titles. Without further ado, because we are already behind uh, behind uh, time, I would like to thank our partner, which is the Afro Middle East Center, with whom we have the privilege and honor to work for the third years on this conference. And we hope that we will move forward this partnership to new level. And I would like to invite the executive director of the Afro Middle East Center, uh, Naim Jinnah to deliver a welcome remarks, and afterward we would be, uh, we would like to invite the president of Al Shark Forum, Mr. Wadah Kamfar, to deliver his keynote, and then we will move to the first plenary session. Naim, please join me. <clears throat> Good.
Good morning, and just to echo what, uh, what Ghalib said, in, in South Africa you definitely would not have this many people on a Sunday morning um, at, at any conference, in any event. Um, I see that a number of people in the room with red ties and headscarves and shirts and dresses. I'm guessing that you, because it's a Sunday morning and you uh, still a bit uh, dazed from last night, that you came to the wrong room. The Karl Marx birthday party is on the other side. Um, okay, and, and I say that with my red shirt. Thank you for pointing that out. With that, I was also dazed this morning. Um, I'm not going to uh, um, get into any long introduction uh, because uh, Ghalib started with an introduction, except to say that along with the Shark Forum, we are very pleased to be hosting this conference once again, the third time in a row. Um, and we hope to be saying this again in, in three years' time or in five years' time. Um, because we have uh, now decided, as Ghalib said, to make this uh, um, a, a longer-term arrangement and partnership between us, focusing on this issue of um, security arrangements in, in the region. So from um, the Afro-Middle East Center, based in Johannesburg in, in South Africa, and some might wonder why we this, that far away are so concerned about these issues. Um, we are because we believe that they're important. As South Africans, we believe that the Middle East region um, and North Africa, of course, uh, are important um, for us and for the rest of the world. So I want to join Ghalib in welcoming you all uh, for, this, for this conference, for the open day, open part of the conference, and hope that by the end of the day, um, when I'll be up here again, that we will have reached a um, situation where we've had really good discussions and debates and taken the issue and the questions that will be raised early on um, further than, than they have been up to now. Thank you. Well, thank you. Now I would like to invite Ustaz Waddaq Khanfar, the president of Al Shark Forum, to deliver the keynote. Assalamu alaikum. Actually, I didn't have red shirt. I had fantastic Mandela shirt, which I had yesterday, and I thought of having it today, but unfortunately, they said, no, it's much more formal to have a tie. On Sunday, it is torturous, but at least, you know, this is how it goes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good morning to all of you. And from South Africa, I would like actually to start. First, I would like to thank Naeem and Afro Middle East Center for this great opportunity. This is the third year that this conference is actually discussing one of the most important issues, not only for the region, but for the world, which is security architecture for the uh, Shark region or MENA. And this is, for me, is a great success. The fact that all of us gathered together for three years in order to develop Something that could take us out of this deep crisis is a major, actually, um, major achievement. South Africa, to start with again, is a country which I personally owe a lot to. I've spent in South Africa eight years, and I landed just a few months after Nelson Mandela became president in 1994. And during that period, I remember the amount of fear, skepticism, and the amount of speculation that South Africans across the race barrier had in the transformation and reconciliation that started immediately after Nelson Mandela became the president of South Africa. However, I've just come back from South Africa. 24 hours ago, I was there, and I thought that the country that I visited 23 years after Nelson Mandela launched this magnificent reconciliation in, the, in, in South Africa has reached a stable destination. Yes, still people would argue about the rights of certain groups. I met Africans who are not satisfied very much with the transformation, and they think that the uh, whites are still dominating the economy. I met whites who are not satisfied with the current reality, and they think the Africans are practicing counter uh, racism against them. But everyone has accepted the game and the rules of the game that this country should continue to embrace all its citizens and to have its own identity as a state with rainbow nation, with diversity, 
and with acceptance of rule of law. Democracy has succeeded in creating transformation in a society which all of us expected maybe in a moment of time that might drift into a situation which civil war, chaos, economic collapse might be the features of it. Luckily, that did not happen in South Africa. Coming back to the region, a region that might be at this moment in time even worse than what the South Africans experienced by the late 80s, beginning of 90s, where the blood and bloodshed and violence has become the dominant paradigm of behavior politically in this region, I would argue that South Africa model and many other models in the world could play very handy at this moment in time in recognizing and understanding that always there will be hope if we have proper paradigm of thinking and proper leadership that could transfer the current reality into much more suitable and prosperous and stable reality. 2017-2018, one year has passed since the last conference, and during this year there are certain trends that in my opinion should be mentioned at this moment in time in order to build up a much more overall thinking about this region in particular. First, when we speak about the security of a region, I must first ask security of whom? Whose security are we talking about? We, as intellectual elite and mostly political elite in this part of the world, have seen ourselves through the lens of the West for decades. And the security that we have been talking about most of the time in our think tanks and in our circles was the interest of the West in our countries. This is why it should be clear to all of us that when we speak about the security arrangement for MENA region, we are speaking about arrangements that are ma made in the region for the region. Not only because this region has reached the moment of realization that the Western influence in this part of the world was destructive and is still destructive and has never provided security nor prosperity to us, but also because pragmatically and practically it is impossible to achieve permanent security structure in a region if that is a reflection of a Western or foreign interest, regardless of which interest in, the, in, in this region. We acknowledge that this region is part of the world and the security of this region is part of the international security. And any kind of major disturbance that could happen in MENA region or the Sharq region eventually will reflect badly on everyone else. This is why we are concerned not only about our security in the region, but also on international security that we are part of it. Therefore, when we are calling a conference or getting together to discuss something for the region, having international experts with us from across the world, we are building a model which should be authentic, legitimate, from the region, for the region, putting at the center of it people, not powers, in order to survive. States have failed people in this part of the world. And people are maturing with the pain and suffering that they have endured during the last few decades, actually for the last one century, until today. And therefore, if we are thinking of a model, that model should always keep at its heart the human being and the citizen of this part of the world. During this year, we had major trends emerging in this region. One of them is a continuity of erosion of institutions, regional institutions. The last active one, reasonably, was the GCC and the Gulf Cooperation Council, which practically now is in uh, hibernation because of the Qatar crisis. And that means that we can now say that, at least in the Arab world, we don't have any active regional organization that people could refer to as a final 
decision maker in the region. This is, of course, one of the worst things that have happened. But besides that as well, in the next few days, we are going to see what Mr. Trump is going to do about the Iran deal. If he is going to do what he is talking about for the last few days, including last night, in my opinion, this is going to add another dimension to the current reality and to the future of this region. When Mr. Trump is trying to reshape, renegotiate, and reintroduce something new into the region, in my opinion, this will have its own trigger new dynamics and the trigger new issues that none of the current leaders of the West, including Mr. Trump himself and the rest of the European countries, are capable of answering. And therefore, the ambiguity and the moving towards a future which none of us can actually identify perfectly at this moment in time is going to happen. This is why. I would assume that this is one of the major trends happening in the region that we need to notice and to find out exactly how this will affect all of us in this part of the world. The third one, we have unfortunately certain kind of illusion emerging in the region. Some actors in the region thought that they can have their own regional order established by themselves without having neither the capability nor the tools to do so. A regional order should emerge out of consensus and agreement and dialogue that is inclusive and does not basically establish itself versus anyone else in the region. Otherwise, it's not going to be an order. It's going to be a project for chaos. In my opinion, the current reality that we are facing in this part of the world from certain actors indicate to the fact that there is some form of utopian dreams about geopolitics, fueled only by money and by necessities for survival, which will not, at any moment in time, reach proper order that could create stability. It will only increase the rift and increase the violent transformation that all of us are going through. This is a very serious one. It might boil down to the fact that some of us have ambitions, personal ambitions or imperial ambitions, but all of that is not springing from a proper realization, an objective realization of the fact that we are going through a stalemate in the region. It seems to me that none of us, or not all of us at least, have understood that we are properly in a stalemate. None of us is going to be victorious in this battle. None of us is going to dominate this region. None of us on his own is going to be the superior decision maker or the emperor of this part of the world. That stalemate is objectively there. But unfortunately, subjectively, we have not yet reached there. We have not acknowledged that we are in a stalemate, that the bloodshed in Yemen is not going to take us anywhere. The bloodshed in Syria, the bloodshed in Libya, and the current situation taking place in everywhere of this region is not going to end with a victory of one party, one regime, or one country in the region over others. That realization for those who are deciding on the fate of the region is not there. This is why we have deficit of leadership in the region. And we have people who are not aware of the consequences of their whims and their illusion and their imperial feeling about what could be done and what should not be done at this moment in time. Lack of experience and lack of maturity on geopolitical front. Palestine. Another trend has emerged during the last 12 months, which in my opinion, very serious one and should be always taken seriously in the discussion about any security arrangement in the future. Palestine is at the heart of the Middle East, at the heart of a lot of transformation issues that are happening in the Middle East, not from now, for decades. But unfortunately, during the last 12 years, we have again seen the transactional attitude of the American administration spilling over 
to some of our leaders in the region, from the Arab side and even from the, or the Israeli side, of course, and the quick fix that has been introduced is going not only is not going to work, of course, but it's going even to complicate the situation further. When we are talking about Palestine as a solution, not for the sake of resolving the conflict and reaching a situation of permanent solution, but of gaining certain gains for this person or that person or this regime or, their, or that regime, or for the sake of normalization of a relationship with Washington or Tel Aviv, it means that what is going to happen will lack legitimacy and it does lack the aspiration that all the people of this region are looking forward to achieve about this Palestinian issue. Some of us might argue, and I have been asked by many friends and colleagues in the West, we thought that when Mr. Trump decides to acknowledge Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, the world will cease to exist, the sun will stop rising from the east, and everything is going to explode. I said, you do not understand this region. This region does not behave like that. You may reach a conclusion like that, not tomorrow or the day after, but the accumulation of what is happening at this moment in time about these rushed decisions is going to have the response, but not necessarily in the form that you are seeking. We are not behaving on the same rhythm that the American administration or the Western societies understand and react to. We are societies that restore memories, accumulate feelings, and then act upon it. But you can never forget the fact that justice and the right of people to have a freedom in their society and in their land is at the heart of everyone. Without it, eventually, more complexities will emerge. This is why I warn against the trend of dealing with the Palestinian issue in the simplistic and the immediacy that some actors in the region and internationally are trying to do. The other trend which I see happening, the issue of Islam and politics. ISIS declined in the region, and that's good news. The violence that ISIS represented during the last few years is much less. I can't say that the threat itself has, has been eradicated, but I would say definitely there is a great success in that regard. With it, there is a trend of dealing with Islam again as a utility in the hand of a state. Now, the rise of ISIS and the fact that all of us suffered from that does not justify to anyone to have ownership of Islam. Because, not because the argument of a transformation and reform within Islamic circles is necessary, which I acknowledge, and I think we need a lot to be said about how could Muslims in this part of the world, Islamic thinkers, political Islamists, many others, could really engage in a serious di dialogue and debate about the future of movements, the future of ideas, the future of theology in dealing with reality. That is absolutely important and necessary and should be done. But that should never be done in the name of the state. Why? These are ideas to people are very close. When someone owns that and try to utilize it for the sake of short political gain, we are in the front of another crisis that might lead to another radicalization and terrorism and violence. Very important idea to notice. If you are running a theocracy, it was a traditional, and then you would like to modernize it, and then it continues to be a theocracy, Hands off religion is important in this part of the world. Neither a state that is pushing people towards Islam in a, in, in a violent way or in a, in, a, in, a, in, in a way that forces them to do things, and ISIS did that to a large extent, nor, nor states that are utilizing Islam to justify any, any political gain within the societies or transformation within their societies. This is when we argue about Islam and the reform within Islamic circles. We should 
be very careful not to associate that with the authority of the state, neither in a positive or a negative way. This is something that the society, the intellectuals, the scholars, the debate within the society should develop to achieve some form of social and religious contract that could evolve with time, and that easily could evolve if it is not used as a political utility. Now, on the positive side of things, we have witnessed in the region also a realization that we could talk to each other. I think more and more people now are talking about a security architecture for the region. We heard ministers, heads of states, during the last few months talking across the world about the necessity of having some form of security arrangement in the Middle East or in the region. That is positive. At least we realize that this idea that three, months, three years ago was discussed in Istanbul through a Sharq and Amik is now growing. And a lot of people are realizing the necessity of having that form of architecture through dialogue in the region. And also there is another trend which I think at least should be welcomed, the fact that Iran, Turkey, and Russia had a meeting in Asitana and they had a process to follow, in my opinion, is a positive thing. At least we realize that we could resolve our conflicts through talking to each other. You should remember that just two, three years ago, Russia and Turkey were on the brink of, of confrontation. The fact that now we could talk and resolve our issues is, is very important. That is said. I should also say that a process like this, or any region, or any international process, can never substitute the fact that the Syrian people should be at the heart of any arrangement regarding Syria. And Syria should never become just an international issue or an arena of testing the boundaries of international powers. A permanent solution in Syria should always include the Syrian people and their aspirations as part of it, rather than having it internationalized or even put in a regional framework without regard to the Syrian aspirations. The other point that I would like to mention about positive things, you know, we have gone through, especially in the Arab world, major transformation from 2011. The Arab Spring has introduced, in a moment of time, a utopian feeling to people who, most of us at that time, lacked experience. And definitely the overwhelming joy and the triumphant feeling of the fact that only through our voices could bring down regimes and dictators has filled us with a lot of hope that now we realize that it was, in a way or another, exaggerated. This utopia of change and the quick fix that thought we are going to establish definitely right now is not what is in the mind of the young people in the streets of the Arab world. But would we say that the counter-revolutions that happened in the region and the blood that has been shed has eradicated the ideal from the minds of the people, which is the perpetual quest for free, legitimate, fair societies that humans could live in with dignity and human right? Of course not. Simply because any other narrative introduced from 2013 until today in this part of the world did not succeed in giving any positive imagination about the future. What has been introduced to us is security-centered solution. Jails, confiscation of rights, imprisonment of activists, and also suppression of any aspiration. Would you assume that this solution can be permanent? Unless if we assume that the humans in this part of the world are not like humans in the rest of the universe who could accept to live under tyranny and under corrupt regimes forever. I do think that we are similar to any homo sapiens anywhere else in the world. We have that feeling 
embedded in us for freedom, for democracy, for human rights, and for good governance, and for justice. And this is why I warn against the trend that I sense in many intellectual circles and think tanks about the fact that democracy in the Arab world is not a necessity at this moment in time. It did create chaos, and therefore it doesn't serve the interest neither of the West nor of the region. What could serve the interest of the people of the region more than having a free atmosphere and the free air that they could breathe? This is why, in my opinion, during the last few years, it has been much more clear to most of these activists on the ground in this part of the world that the West has not been only exhausted and tired, but has lost moral values in dealing with this part of the world. The word democracy has disappeared from the lexicon of most of the politicians in the West about our, about our region. It has become a dirty word. No one utters and speaks about it. That is definitely not going to convince us to accept reality and the status quo as it is. In my opinion, most of the people are going through transformation. What transformation are the young people and our regions going through? Now we realize that change is a generational issue. We realize that we have started writing a narrative and a story that will continue to be written for a long time to come. This means we need to be strategically patient. And we need to give whatever of resources, effort, and support to the process of transformation until it is achieved. Rather than that, we are going to introduce a dark hole in a region that will eventually not only interrupt its own security and continue the misery and the blood of, it, of its own people, but also will affect and have major impact on the international society. Leadership is very important. I said about Nelson Mandela, he is definitely my, one of my role models in many aspects, because I personally, the first book I read in English was Long Walk to Freedom, which I started translating at that time. But I would say, you need leaders in this part of the world. Of course, we need informed people, and this is happening right now. In my opinion, that the people, in their aspirations and their ideas about themselves and the future are more mature than most of the leaders. We need proper leadership that puts at the interest, at the center of, the, of their interest, the people and the future of this region. And we need people who are not ideologically driven. Not necessarily they are extreme in their ideas. Not necessarily they are rebels. But most importantly, that they are sincere about the interest of their people and the interest of their nations. And they look at the region and say, we are heading towards an environment of prosperity and stability. We are going to have these leaders one day. But until then, I advise political actors, movements, political parties, and even the elite not to center their thoughts and ideas around power of the state. We need to go back to the public, to the people, to the rural areas, to the camps, to the refugee camps. We need to speak to the people. We need to engage in a proper and serious education process for ourselves and them. We need to come down from where we are sitting, most of us, conveniently during the last few years, we go back to the origin of our cause. It is the public, it is the people and their aspiration. We can never succeed if we lock ourselves as an elite within the boundaries of what the state is offering us or what the international, even society, is offering, offering us. This is, again, an issue of people must go back to the people. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you very, very much for this very inspiring and passionate speech. And we would like to now invite the first panel, uh, the first panelist to the floor. Uh, Ustaz, both of you, and Minister Fala, uh, used at the back. Well, assalamu alaikum again. In the first plenary, as some of you that have their booklet in front of themselves, as also we spoke this morning, because the prevalence vocabulary of the recent times has been the nature of the conflict, the nature of the threat, and the nature of the crisis. But the problem with this vocabulary is when we say conflict, when we say crisis, and when we say threat, we don't mean the same things. So the crisis that uh, when, I, you know, when I visit, let's say, like Iran, the nature of the crisis that they will discuss is quite different than the nature of crisis that are being discussed in Turkey and the nature of the crisis that are being discussed in Arab world or you know, when I went to Kurdistan in Kurdistan. So in a sense, in the region, there is the word crisis as a shared vocabulary, which also created some kind of like public space or a public language that is used by everyone. But when it comes to like what we mean by the crisis, what we mean by the conflict, what we mean by the threat, it is absolutely like, you know, we mean different things. And that actually like, you know, generate different response, different mechanism and different solutions. And this solution in the end becomes the part of the problem. So in this session, I will try to like ask like participants what they mean when they mean like, you know, when they speak of the crisis from different perspective. Actually, let me first start with Yust. We had a beautiful paper written by Yust, which will be on, uh, which will be online tomorrow at Al Shark Forum. I encourage all of you to read. But Yust, I mean, when we say crisis in the region, because in 2011, we meant something different. 2013, we meant something different. Now we mean something different. Like, A, what do we mean? Like, you know, what is the crisis of the region when we talk about the crisis? And related to this, also because the word conflict is very, you know, uh, used quite often, how the conflict, the nature of the conflict is changing in the region. <coughs> Thank you, thank you very much, Galeb, and uh, thank you, Wada, for your speech earlier. That um, also feeds into this, obviously. And, um, and thank you for the organizers uh, um, for, for giving me a little bit of time to, uh, to talk about this. I mean, the, the crisis is um, multidimensional and, and goes very deep. Um, and the, uh, there is a paper I just did, but uh, there's another one. Um, that, that I want to very, give a very uh, short synopsis uh, of, which is that um, if we look at, um, at conflicts in the region today, and I come from, at it from a conflict perspective uh, because of my professional uh, activities, um, then we see that uh, at, at, uh, since the Arab uprisings uh, in 2011, uh, conflicts have accumulated. Um, but the, the, the problem is, is that we, we look at these conflicts and we seem to, uh, and certainly as outsiders, uh, we look at them as, as surface phenomena. Um, and we, we follow day by day and trying to find ways to manage these conflicts. But there's a real danger that we don't actually look at the deeper drivers uh, of these conflicts and that in ignoring the deeper drivers, the remedies that we uh, prescribe uh, end up doing more harm than good. 
Um, and uh, of course, the first principle uh, any time when we try to fix things is to do no further harm. Uh, in an emergency room in a hospital, that would be a surgeon's uh, first uh, 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 rule, that um, you try to stem the bleeding and you apply bandages uh, and you uh, give, provide medicine, but you do not make matters worse by uh, per performing a certain surgery that is certainly not uh, the, 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 uh, what could do uh, actually the long-term harm. So the, the, the way I look at the drivers of the conflict in the, in the Middle East and North Africa, uh, we have to go back 100 years. I'm not going to do that here. But, um, but if we look at uh, the, the layers of conflict and we look at the Syrian conflict in particular, uh, we need to see that uh, the, the, there are uh, what I call conflict clusters that have accumulated. Uh, there. The first one is the uh, order or disorder that was created uh, after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire in the First World War, uh, which was always a dysfunctional order, and of course it has changed tremendously in a hundred years, and has uh, certainly not uh, still have, uh, have the colonial features, but, but the colonial features also are still there to some extent, but it has also uh, produced new features. And in fact, the, the disorder itself led eventually to a legitimacy crisis that came to an end, or that ended the new stage with the Arab uprisings in 2011. So it took that long, really, to overturn that order, or to at least challenge it in places. Of course, it has come back to some extent in Egypt and other places. But that, is, that was the first uh, cluster. The second cluster, of course, the creation of the State of Israel. Um, and, and it was seen as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, uh, a Western uh, interference uh, and uh, attempt to divide the Arab world and, and affect the larger Middle East. And that is playing again still today, uh, because the actors involved in that are active today in the Syrian conflict as well. Um, the third cluster is the Iranian revolution and its, its outcome. And uh, the, uh, the radicalization that it brought at the time um, and the basis that it laid for uh, Iran's rise uh, in the region that we see today. The fourth cluster is the intra-Sunni uh, debate that took place and the radicalization that we've seen in the form of, uh, in its most extreme form, in, in the rise of Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. And then the fifth cluster is, 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 is not the Arab uprising so much, but the aftermath and the failure of the Arab uprisings and the chaos and civil war that they created in a number of uh, places in the Middle East. If we look at the Syrian crisis in particular, we see that all of these clusters have converged, and, but each one has its own internal drivers, their conflict families that have, like any family, has its own internal differences, but now they've, come, they've started to bleed into one another. And if you look at the Syrian war and you want to say, we need to bring it to an end, how do we do it? If you don't, uh, do not understand these different layers, you're going to come up with partial solutions that may fix one little thing, but actually make other aspects of it worse. The Syrian conflict is a good example because we can say, okay, uh, right now the regime is starting to prevail in Damascus. It is defeating its opponents, the opposition, the rebels. Um, but yet we see that new conflicts are emerging between Turkey and uh, the, the PKK, uh, between Israel and Iran. Um, there are still conflicts uh, playing themselves out in, in eastern Syria, also in Idlib. Uh, uh, in southern Syria, where, where, uh, near the Jord Jordanian border. Um, all, all of these uh, are continuing and, in fact, are, are only just starting. Um, and it is because, in fact, uh, this is a, a multi-layered conflict that has been accumulated over, over, over time. Now, in addition to the clusters, I want to introduce one other concept, which is a very old one and there's nothing new about it, is the, the, the idea of concentric circles which is that the conflicts start locally. And this is important because Wadah mentioned the importance that the Syrian conflict in the end be settled by Syrians themselves. Conflicts start locally, but they uh, invite uh, interference, outside interference. And that's often first at the regional level. And of course, in Syria, we've seen that with the interference of the Gulf states uh, and Iran and others, uh, Hezbollah, outside actors that have come in to either side uh, of, the, of the conflict. Then you see that global powers become involved as well, on top of that. So the United States and Russia, in this case, uh, because they have their own issues and they also take sides. The, the way to, to, uh, to address these conflicts must go in reverse. 
Um, and I'm not saying that the United States and Russia can solve the Syrian conflict. They cannot. But they can create the environment in which actors below them can start uh, resolving the conflict. Regional actors also cannot solve the Syrian conflict. But they also need to provide the space, a common, some kind of common ground, some shared interest, some shared vision, uh, which al would allow the Syrians themselves to finally to settle their conflict. Eventually, all conflicts come to an end. Hopefully, they come to an end in some way that uh, prevents a re-emergence of deep grievances that would simply set the stage for a new round of conflict. But if we don't, so this, what I'm proposing is a methodology of looking at conflicts. I'm certainly speaking mostly to a Western audience in this case, not necessarily you gathered here, but uh, in our work we want to uh, ensure that, that Western states in particular are, uh, have their eyes wide open when they go into the region with their development and reconstruction aid or with their militaries and uh, perpetrate yet another form of inter intervention, whatever form it takes, and actually do much more harm uh, uh, than, than good. And uh, the next example is going to come up very soon because we will find out soon what Mr. Trump decides about the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal. But we may easily see that uh, uh, instead of uh, helping to, uh, to, to, to stabilize the region and allow people to solve their own problems, in fact, they will be worsened. So that's where we are. And on that happy note, I hand back the microphone. Well, thank you very much for sticking to the time. And in the current session, I will come to you by actually posing you a very practical question as well, too, which was also discussed yesterday. In the region right now, where to start, the question of where to start is one of the crucial questions. Uh, so therefore, I will come to you, like you know, uh, on the question of where to start. Yus uh, Hilterman, the director of the MENA program of ICG, thank you very much. Now I will go to the major player of the region. We have Turkey, we have Iran, I mean, people from Iran, they don't have to represent this official view. We have Saudi Arabia, we have Libya and Kurdistan. So let me start with Iran. Ustaz Professor Sajapur, the Deputy Prime Minister of Iran, also the President of the IPRS. One of the things which has been very striking for the people uh, in the region, particularly in recent times, was less than five, six years, was the reaction of the Iran to regional uprisings. Because as a revolutionary state, the expectation was that you know, Iran perhaps will be much more accommodating towards what is happening in the region. But it seems like you know, Iran was the country that was very much disturbed by the, you know, by the disturbance of the status quo. So when looking from the Iran, I mean, the Syria was the most important manifestation of this position. Looking from the Iran, A, what do you see as the root causes of the crisis or the nature of the crisis in the region? Because yesterday, one of the important points that you mentioned was any solution first has to start with good analysis of the things. So when you analyze the region, what do you see as the, major, the main or the major conflict or the crisis uh, that needs to be tackled with? Thank you. Uh, first of all, let me thank you, uh, Ashar, and also Afro uh, and Media East Center of South Africa. Uh, and let me also, uh, uh, in the beginning, uh, emphasize that what I say is my own. I'm not officially here. Usually, I do it by a joke, if I am allowed. Uh, the joke, of course, is different from the other time. The joke is what's different between a diplomat, a scholar, and a general. And the answer is, a general is paid to die for his country hmm? in wars. An ambassador is paid to lie about his country. And a professor is uh, paid to explain why and how and in what format these guys die and lie. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm on this. You know, I don't have much hair, but I have two hats, so I use uh, the academic hat to answer your question. I think uh, there are a lot of, of course, uh, uh, issues uh, in the region. One, of course, is analysis. And I think analysis is key because analysis tells you what the scene is and how you see it. And I think this is very important to have a 
a good picture, like a doctor, you know, when you go for, let's say, a treatment, uh, he should or she should have a picture of your, let's say, bodies. Sometimes they give x-rays or other tests in order to see how it functions. Uh, but in social sciences with normative uh, angles that we start with, sometimes the picture is what we want to get, not what it is in reality. So I think uh, uh, here what's important is analysis and more important than is over assumptions, how you start with. So in answering your question, and actually I thought about how a regional uh, security arrangement can be looked from an Iranian perspective, not the Iranian perspective, I came to A, B, C. A, assumptions. B, beliefs. And C, cooperation uh, exigencies or practicalities. Let me quickly go to this, and I think this is by itself an analysis. First, I think uh, assumptions are key because, as I said, assumptions is your starting point. And there are a lot of assumptions about uh, war, uh, regional arrangement or security arrangement in this region. Some of them are false. And I identified at least three, uh, let's say, assumptions that people have or write in their, their writings. One is what I call uh, uh, impossibility assumption, that it is impossible to cooperate in the Middle East because of the nature of the Middle East, nature of the states, nature of some people go even to the people, and so on and so forth. So they show that, and I think mostly it's a Western uh, view to keep uh, you know, this uh, region uh, in a state of a chaotic situation or organize it in the way that they want by saying that it's impossible that regional players have uh, a, a secret arrangement from within. Second assumption, I call it similarity assumption, that they use this OSON and the EU as models, that we can apply this. So I think you can get lessons from these two areas, but this region is totally different from uh, OSON region and from Europe, though there are some similarities, but similarities are not enough to draw, let's say, the, the uh, format. Uh, the third uh, assumption, which is wrong, I call it auxiliary assumption, that we need a big power as an auxiliary force to come and organize uh, the region and to have security arrangement. I think uh, all of them negate the realities of region. And the region is very complex. The region has multiple layers of actors, crises, problems, and uh, I think issues and challenges. So if assumptions are wrong, I go to my B. B is belief. We have to have a belief that the region can solve itself, its own problem. Maybe it is funny for some people, but I do believe it. And here, I would have very three quick, three quick points. First, I think there is a need for a regional self-confidence. Regional self-confidence that the region can solve itself, its problem. And I think if and now we are getting to the 40th the, uh, anniversary of Iran revolution, for me as a student, as a person raised in revolution, maybe the most important lesson of the Iranian revolution is self-confidence, that you can do it. They were saying that the Iranian revolution is impossibility, but it was, and now it is in its 40th year. And I, I think we have a national self-confidence that we can manage the issues and challenges. The same applies to the region. I think, first of all, there should be national self-confidence created in a different place of the region. Finally, there should be a regional self-confidence, which I'm sure it would emerge. Second belief, I think, is belief in regional connectivity. We are not Europe. We are not South Asia. This region is one region. I have one example. I'm happy that I'm talking, talking in Turkey. You have Maulana here, huh? 
where is Maulana's grave in Wunia? Where he was, where was he born? In Balkh. Where is Balkh today? In Afghanistan. In which language did his uh, poetry, which is a universal poetry, and that is uh, Persian. So Mulana is welcomed, uh, appreciated through the region as a figure that ever finished. I can't stop. Oh, sure. oh, I can't stop. In the region, this is you know the Western style. So. <laughs> no, I, I, I finish very quickly. Um, Mulana is a symbol of connectivity of this region. I can talk on the regional connectivity, which has been actually impaired by imperial interventions during uh, not just last century, few last centuries, the past. Finally, I think uh, there should be a belief that there is a regional space emerged after the collapse of Soviet Union. I think that's very important to identify now if you compare it with the Cold War, Cold War time, any regional arrangement was vertical, coming from the top. NATO, CENTO, CETO, and all this we had. Now, horizontal cooperation is possible. And this is key for our understanding. And we should believe in it, that regional players, big or small, can have a role. Uh, so uh, let me go my quickly, I think, so the, if the belief for cooperation is needed and is a possibility, then cooperation has some requirements. Most of all, we have to find the uh, scope. We cannot be very big, but we have to be very practical. A scope is very important. Second, I think there should be pockets of cooperation, and pockets of cooperation in decision cannot be without pockets of resistance. We should resist impositions of the others. And I think there are now so-called pushback policy to push back Iran, to push back Turkey from the region. And we have to resist. There are pushback about making our size uh, somehow uh, different. I think we, we have to resist. Finally, I think there are uh, urgent issues the, in the Persian Gulf, especially in Levant, and can be picked as issues and work on with. Our foreign minister had a suggestion. Uh, two, two weeks ago, he registered it in his speech at uh, United Nations high-level meeting on sustainable uh, the, uh, peace, and that is to have a region, a strong region, with win-win solution, not being in exclusive with inclusivity of all, uh, literal states of the Persian Gulf, and I think it's uh, uh, and refer with reference to resolution 598, operative paragraph number eight. I think that is where it can, can be a focus, and a lot of uh, challenges can be managed. Uh, now I want to get to Syria, in that you asked, but I hope I know that I don't have time, so I answer. Maybe, it. yeah. Thank you very much. And actually, I want to also pose you another question because. I'm pleased that you refer to the Iranian Revolution because exa exactly as you, uh, as you said, this was seen by many as impossible, but the reality is that it has been like, you know, 40 years that it's there, it's functioning, and now we are talking about like, you know, Iran as the Iran moment in the region. Uh, and one of the in in interesting things was that the Iranian Revolution was one of the very peaceful revolution because the street was with you. So the power of street, you felt it, you read. Now, wherever you go in the Arab world, the street is against you. So you have the problem. Not, not everywhere. Oh, many places, at least. <laughs> many, many, many places. No, I can go. So in this regard, in this regard, where do you see your problem is with the street in the Arab world? Because I understand why Saudi Arabia has problem with the street, why UAE has a problem with street, why Egypt has a street. But a revolution that was succeeded with the street, now you have problem with with almost like street everywhere. Yeah. So what's your crisis? I will come after you to you, so please, eh? we'll have second round. And now actually you know, Turkey. I'm ready to answer right now, but I will wait. Sure, now I will go to uh, Mesut Özcan, who is the director of Diplomacy Academy of Turkish Prime Ministry. And I will pose a similar question to you too, because as I said, like, 
unless we have a consensus on what is the crisis, we will not have like you know, a solution. And Turkey seems to have like you know changing its idea of what is the root cause of the crisis in the Middle East. In 2010-11, it had a region-wide language, and it saw the defunct authoritarian structure as the root cause of the crisis. 2013, it was something that. Now it seems like you know Turkey's regional policy is just Turkey's border policy. So from Turkey's perspective, what is the you know the nature of the crisis in the region? And secondly, does Turkey at this stage have any some form of sustainable response to what it sees as the major crisis in the region rather than beyond the language that we are hearing, which is just nation security and quite introverted looking? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for this invitation by Ashak and AMEC. Once again, I'm very pleased to be here. And second, similar to Dr. Sajat a disclaimer, I'm uh, representing here on my own uh, sure. academic background, so nothing to do with the ministry. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Maybe an academic cooperation. Uh, in international politics, a crisis are described by three terms, high threat, short term, surprise. Normally, in international politics, you are discussing about crisis issues, crisis. You are thinking that this is a very high threat, posing a very high threat to you. Uh, you have to have very short time to answer this, and also you got by surprise. But when we look to the Arab uprisings or when we look to the crisis in the region, some of these crises are very old, not very new one, as it's described by Wada Hanfar, the Palestinian issue, or other crises in the region. So they are very long-term crises. We are not, uh, let's say, talking about crises that got us by surprise. But on the other hand, Arab uprisings are kept, are, are surprising many people, because when we look to the trajectory of the region, over the years, over the decades, after the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire, there was an order in the region, European-centric order, but this was not very much addressing to the real issues of the region. During the Cold War years, the Middle East was a superpower rivalry, a, a arena for the superpower rivalry. Still, there were lots of problems in the region, lots of crises, but these are not addressed properly. And at that time, there was a kind of stability in the region, political stability, and this political stability was covering all other crises. On, people were not talking about these issues in maybe in details or maybe not addressing these issues in very uh, real manner. But after the end of the Cold War, there were lots of uh, crises as well. The Gulf crisis, the Iraq occupation of Kuwait, and the crisis continued in the region. But when we come to the Arab uprisings, the, the real causes of the problem, the real cause of the crisis was the political crisis, the representation, the political participation. People were not happy with the conditions that they are living with. In addition to this, there were lots of economic and social reasons of it. And from a Turkish point of view, Turkey was saying that these issues should be addressed in a, in a way in which the expectations of the people on the street must be addressed. What, what were these expectations? These were participation to the, uh, let's say, political processes, an equal distribution of economic wealth, fight against corruption, etc. And on the other hand, the participation of the especially young people to the political uh, process. And from that point on, Turkey described this issue and tried to answer these issues along with other players in the region. But on the other hand, as Galip, you asked, over the time, the crisis, crisis in the region also transformed itself, themselves as well. Because we are not only referring one particular issue, one particular country, one particular crisis. So we, what we witnessed after the Arab uprisings, a nationwide crisis. Uh, the state system that was established after 1950s and after the World War II came to an end. So people were questioning the legitimacy of the state system in the region. So we can say this was a kind of state crisis, the systemic, systemic crisis. So people were thinking that the established system is not answering their demands anymore. Because during the Cold War years, there was such a kind of understanding, a similar, a similar to the, let's say, socialist or communist approach. The state will provide its citizens the very basic services, security, let's say very basic service, electricity, some others, but the people will not ask for participation. So you will get services, you will get the security, but you will not ask for participation to the political process. But in a gradual way, 
the security provided by the state, the services provided by the state to the citizens declined. The quality of these services declined. And at the same time, people get aware of the other options all around the world. So they were asking the same conditions. They were asking the same rights. So this was the main reason, in my understanding, the crisis that emerged with the Arab uprisings. And on the other hand, there were some pro-change, let's say, players in the region and outside of the region, and also some players against the change. So currently, unfortunately, we are witnessing times in which the anti-change, let's say, actors are also playing, and also they are trying to influence the dynamics on the ground. But on the other hand, it's not that easy to curtail all of these demands or to overcome all of these demands only with some harsh measures, with some security issues. The, the real demands are there. The demands are not met. The demands are not <clears throat> answered, both in terms of political participation, also economic rights. And definitely, there will be much discussions, much demands for this change. From a Turkish point of view, what has changed over time, over the Arab uprising years, Definitely, from the first day, Turkey thought that Turkey agreed that this, this change should be supported. This is a real, there is a real demand for change, so this demand should be supported. But in a gradual way, with the transformation of the developments on the region, and in, with an increasing, uh, let's say, securitization of the issue or the conflicts in the region, so definitely, Turkey has to take into account its security issues as well. Because as a result of the problems, as a result these uprisings, we witnessed state failures. As a result of these state failures, security issues gained ground, and Tur Turkey and other actors have to answer these uh, security challenges. Currently, most of the issues in the region, in the Middle East, uh, are seen or analyzed or, let's say, uh, looked from a security perspective. On the other hand, we should not forget that before, there are also some other crises are emerging as well, like the environmental crisis or related with water usage and other issues. So unfortunately, we will be talking to a certain extent to, for a certain time, these type of crises emerging in the region, and we have to find answers with the participation of local players that has to be local answers, but we should not forget that Middle East is one of the most penetrated region of the world. So definitely, there will be some foreign players as well. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. But uh, the question that you should be also still thinking is, at this stage, is Turkey still a transformative actor in the region, which believes the regional stability cannot be achieved without regional transformation? Or does Turkey like more and more moving towards the idea that any form of the stability, even an authoritarian stability, or, uh, you know, a stability that generates quite uh, anger, frustration, is preferable to a messy and, and a cumbersome transformation. Uh, I will go to Ustaz Jamal Khashivci. Ustaz Jamal Khashivci, many of you perhaps know him. Uh, he is one of the best known Saudi intellectuals, public intellectuals, journalists, uh, and recently he has been written quite extensively on what is happening in Saudi Arabia and what is happening in the region as well, too. And I will ask the question to you as twofold, because Saudi Arabia seems to be operating both with the fears at the domestic political order level, and with the fears at the regional political order level. At the domestic political level, it seems any movement for the change uh, as the major threat, and that for like the Saudi reaction towards the Arab Spring as well too. At the regional level, it still sees the movements that represent this change as threat, but it also seems to have a status anxiety vis-a-vis -vis Iran. So when you look at from there, like from you know Saudi Arabia, I know that you don't represent the Saudi Arabia. I know that you are very critical of what is happening in the recent times, but nevertheless, when you try to understand the you know the Saudi positions, what do they see? I mean, because we hear that always that the Iran is a problem is one of the line that comes, but what is the crisis 
and what is the Saudi perception of threat in the region, and what does Saudi Arabia offer to the region? Does Saudi Arabia has any answer that can be, you know, go beyond the regime in Saudi Arabia and have appeal uh, in some other places in the region? Thank you, Ghalib. I just give a very quick answer to your question. Saudi Arabia is a 100 years old monarchy, and monarchies don't like change. But it is created an autocracy out of monarchy. It, 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 it is that too, but basically they, they, they are afraid of change, whether the change coming from democracy or from revolution of, of, of any sort. And that happened throughout uh, the history. That's how uh, monarchies in Europe reacted to the French Revolution. Uh, but of course, by that position, I think Saudi Arabia has lost an opportunity to benefit and secure stability in the region that will have a positive impact on the country. Uh, but let's talk about more the perception throughout the region. In principle, there should be a call for a meeting uh, led by Saudi Arabia or Turkey uh, to discuss the aftermath of uh, Trump-anticipated decision to pull out or renegotiate the Iranian nuclear arrangement agreement. Of course, such a decision could to blow up the agreement that could uh, it, it could have a huge ramification and it could blow up a region that is already blown up, as, as if we need more trouble in our region. And here is Trump is adding more trouble. Uh, but of course, nobody nobody going to call for this meeting, and nobody going to attend that meeting, because the region and the countries are so divided. In principle, there's a, lo a long list of things that should bring the countries in the region uh, together, uh, from the nuclear agreement or the of the nuclear agreement, to economic difficulties, to shortage of water, to energy, uh, stability, uh, chaos, wars. If I speak two minutes about each one of those, I could consume up my 10 minutes. But all of that should lead to a common agenda, but it's not going to happen. Why is that? I will jump to a shortcut. Why is this? Why there is no cooperation, no uh, common agenda in the region to counter uh, those shared threats? It is all about Arab Spring. It is a decisive thing. I will divide the countries in the region into four groups. Group number one will call it anti-Arab Spring, anti-democracy bloc. That's constitute of my country, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Egypt, Eastern Libya. Uh, they are astonish enemy of Arab Spring, astonish uh, opponent of uh, change and democracy. Uh, not uh, not only by practice, but but only by uh, by, by, by speech. They also lead a campaign through media, through intellectuals, to counter the narrative of change, to counter the narrative of, of Arab Spring, to convince Arab masses that democracy is not good for them. Stability is much better. The old Arab order is much better. They have the nerve even to say the days of Gaddafi was much better for Libya than what is happening today in Libya. They have the nerve to say that. This is a very affirmative, very active, very strong, very much fin uh, financed uh, bloc. The second group, I will call it the anti-Arab Spring uh, and democracy group, but uh, that is Iran and Iraq and uh, Hezbollah. Uh, of course, an Iraqi can now say, no, we, are, we cannot be anti-Arab Spring. We are not ag against democracy. We are going to have an election few days. 
But since they allow mercenaries from Iraq to go and fight their fellow Syrians and, and, and kill the people in Syria, they are anti-Arab spring. Hezbollah is also going to have an election soon, but Hezbollah is also killing free Syrians in Syria. So they are anti-Arab spring. So if those two blocks, the one led by Saudi Arabia and the other one led by Iran, they both are anti-Arab spring. They are both anti-democracy. Why don't they cooperate together? That's where we come to the Iranian-Saudi differences. The Iranians are anti-Arab spring to impose their sectarian vision on the region, to expand, to correct what they think, the, 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 un, the, the unjust course of history uh, toward the Shia minority. They are very sectarians, and they are killing uh, others by uh, the, the, a sectarian narrative. They are supporting a dictator by a sectarian narrative. Everywhere you go and find Iranians active in our region, you only find them with uh, I mean, uh, 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 with sectarian groups. The only exception, and uh, uh, the Hamas Allah give them the opportunity to, 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 to use that excuse that, no, we are not sectarians, we also support Hamas. I wish Hamas will have, uh, will devise that position and, uh, and, 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 and correct their position uh, in, in, in history. Uh, so the Iranians are expanding for sectarian reasons. That make them and the Saudi do not cooperate together because the Saudis' drive for being anti-Arab spring is different from the Iranians. That we, the Saudi, we prefer to bring back the old Arab order, while the Iranians want to bring their their own order. So those two blocks, even though they uh, agree on being anti-democracy spring, but they don't work together. The third group is pro-Arab spring. It's a small group. It is made of uh, Turkey and Qatar. Uh, the Qataris have very limited options to contribute to the support of Arab spring. They, they cannot have an army. They don't have the, uh, the ability to as much as the Saudi and the Emirates. But they have a very important thing to give to uh, pro-Arab Spring, that is freedom of speech, uh, to, be, to give them an, an outlet to, to, uh, to speak. And that is, the, that is very essential. That's why I think in the, in, in the list of 13 demands that Saudi Arabia and uh, the anti-Arab Spring bloc are demanding of Qatari, the most important one is to close Al Jazeera, to shut down uh, media outlet that are providing breathing space to Arab Spring advocate. That is, that is the most important thing. It is not the financing, because financing always can be carried out. And, we sh and, and, and I think anyone who understands uh, the, 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 the politics of the Middle East knows that political Islam movement are low maintenance. They don't need that much money. They will continue in their own, and they, uh, and they have their own financing. So what Qatar is providing that is, it is, that is so essential to uh, the forces of Arab Spring, it is the media space, the, 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 the breathing space. Uh, that's, what, uh, that, that, that's why I think there will be always a pressure on that space to be shut down. Uh, the Turks are between Iraq and a hard place. They have their interest, they, uh, and their interests are very, uh, they, they give it priority, it's a democracy. Uh, so when they go to Syria, they always go first with their own interests, like the, 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 the Kurdish issue. But at the same time, when they have the opportunity to serve, they do serve well. And we have the, 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 the example of Ifrin, uh, where they uh, supported the, the true forces of Arab Spring, the Free Syrian Army. They allowed democracy uh, in Syria and uh, in, 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 in that part of Syria, which could be an example for everybody else. The last group, and I will end with that, it is a group I call Leave Us Alone. It is Jordan, it is Sudan, it is Tunisia. Uh, these groups want from those forces of pro and against Arab Spring to leave them alone. So they will uh, mend their own problems uh, and, uh, and go on with their stability because they feel vulnerable. They, are, they have a, a, a democracy somehow that makes them vulnerable for intervention. So they try to keep a foot in each camp and uh, maneuver their way around. And uh, they just 
simply say to the Saudis and the Turks and to the Qataris, please leave us alone so we will mind our own business. Thank you very much. I'll stop here. Oh, thank you very much. But one question that remains unanswered is the following. Saudi Arabia seems to be to some extent withdrawing from at least some part of the region. Like, you know, in Syria, Saudi Arabia doesn't seem to be having any meaningful stance. But at the same time, Saudi Arabia comes with the demand of that Iran needs to be taken out of the Syria. So what is the strategy? Like, uh, at the same time, you see, despite all the rhetoric and downsizing of the Saudi profile, but on the other hand, you see like a you know, very ambitious Saudi rhetoric, particularly when it comes to vis-a-vis -vis Iran. And secondly, you have a very young, or many will call reformist uh, crown prince. Talks about the economic modernization, talks about the social modernization. But can he do this without political modernization? Like, can you modernize economy, uh, society to a degree uh, where you will not be able to force to do the political modernization. I'll come to you. Now, uh, Ustaz Mustafa Abu Shagur, he is a former deputy prime minister of uh, Libya, and also he is the member of the Libyan House of Representatives. Uh, I would like to pose you the following questions, uh, because we always, like, when we talk about the Arab world or the Middle East, we treat this as if it's a single unit with a homogeneous structure of the problems and the crisis. But apparently, the nature of the crisis is different from Khalid to North, North Africa to, you know, uh, Matruk region. When you look at from, you know, North Africa towards the region, how the nature of the crisis in the North Africa is evolving, how different or similar to what you have been hearing about, particularly the, the Matruk region? Yeah, good morning, and, and, and thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity to be able to bring uh, this issue. Uh, of course, Libya happened to be one of the Arab Spring countries and probably is the, uh, uh, the one who sacrificed the most to be able to uh, bring down an authoritarian regime that uh, dominated the life of Libyans for more than four decades. Uh, and if you look at the, uh, the Arab Spring in general, really, it has changed and reshaped the political and security uh, in, in the region. And because really have, for the first time, the young people and the young, the masses who were disgruntled, who have been oppressed for a long time, they were able to come to the street really demanding very important things, their socioeconomic and political freedom, and to be able part of shaping the future of their lives. And so that's what happens in, in the Arab Spring and Libya it is, is a very example of that. Uh, because in the past, if you look at the, the, the whole region, uh, the, uh, uh, the security has been established to serve the others. And on the cost of the living of the people themselves, they have been living under repression, under oppression just to keep things, looks like from the outside is very stable, but really it was not stability and security that really we, the people, they, they demand. Uh, and so the, uh, so, so the conflicts, if you look at the North African countries, uh, even though they are members of the Arab League and also they have the Moroccan, uh, the, the Maghrib uh, uh, Union, but really they are divided in, in, in reality. They have so much entrenched and historical uh, uh, differences that they continuously uh, come up uh, in this region because that's what caused the instability of the region itself. And so, and some of these are old rivalries that happens between those, those countries, uh, which really continues to, to reshape uh, the future of that part of the world. Uh, and so, and some of them clearly they are really, if you, uh, uh, we happen to be in Libya between two countries who really they're continuously trying to balance uh, their influence in, 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 the, in the region there. Uh, the challenge that they're facing, for, especially for a country like Libya over the last seven years after the Arab Spring and after the revolution that took place, was the intervention, the continuous intervention by the regional powers in Libya through direct intervention by supporting some of the fighting factions in the, in the country, because really they're working on to continuously make sure that this country would be completely unstable. And this is really uh, by intention, because they would like to form it, to shape it, uh, to look 
look exactly the way they are. And, and this is mostly done by uh, what, uh, what uh, Mr. Jamal has mentioned as the, the anti-Arab Spring, anti-democracy bloc. And if you look at the, uh, uh, from one side, if you look at the media, the most the channels, the TV channels in Libya, they are owned by these, the, these countries. These are, they look like they are Libyan channels, but they're financed by those countries. And they have worked over the years to continuously stir the pot in, in Libya to continue the conflict that, that takes place. And so, so if you look at this, and also, of course, because of the, uh, in the North African part of the world, if you look at it, there is, it, first of all, there are vast uh, uh, countries, I mean, huge countries that they are there. There's not much of um, uh, control on their borders. And also, at the same time, happened to be the buffer between the sub-Saharan Africa and Europe. And so it became also added another complexity uh, which these illegal immigrants, who really they have to come, and they became part of the problem uh, in, in those countries, especially in particular Libya, because unfortunately over the last few years, we don't have much control on our borders. So there is a continuous influx of those people who they cause problems in the country. And of course, uh, later on, they're going to, would like to migrate north from, from there. So, so that's another complexity. Uh, also, the, uh, uh, because of the instability and the weak government that there is there, the uh, transnational terrorist groups like ISIS and so on, they try to establish a, a foothold for them in Libya. And in fact, in 2016, they did in the city of Sirte, which is in the center of Libya. And, and nobody talks about this, but really the first defeat that ISIS has faced and the first territory they have lost, it was in Libya. It was fought by the Libyan forces, by some of the armed groups that they are really not uh, official army, but they are really armed groups who they are uh, were behind the revolution. They are the one who defeated ISIS in Sirte, and they were able to uh, e evict them uh, from there. Uh, that's where the first defeat that ISIS have faced uh, literally in there. So, so there is, uh, and also they have, uh, because of this region, there is so much of movement, and also because under the banner of fighting terrorism by the West, uh, this became the battlefield for many of these. And of course, this completely reflects on, on, the, um, uh, on the region that, that, that we are in. And, and so, the, uh, 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 so if you look at this, this picture from the outside, uh, then clearly it might be looked at uh, the, the North Africans, there's so much harm, but really there is none. And that's what we are paying the price for. Uh, I mean, uh, the intervention from our neighbors and also by the foreign powers and the blocs, which they are against what, uh, what we are trying to do. Because the, well, the, those countries, they fear the freedom, they fear democracy, and they don't want to see it. They don't want to see a country like Libya, which has all the, all the, the, the capabilities of being a very prosperous, free country in the region, it becomes an example, and they don't want to see that in that case, so they are doing everything possible to, uh, to prevent that from taking place. Now, if you look at really the, uh, the spirit of the Arab Spring in general, uh, really it has been, I will look at it, it is really because those who they want to destroy are the young people, whom really they saw there is no future for themselves. There is an a opportunity deficit for them, and they see there is no way out uh, from this, so they were able, willing to go out and, 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 and change. Uh, in the, in the, in the, if you look at the North Africa region, really the majority of the population are young people, who really, again, uh, they go to colleges and they graduate, but they find no places for them in, in the job market. And so this provided really an opportunity for radicalization by the extremist groups, to uh, really because they found here is an opportunity of job with, with, those, with those places. They are very well funded uh, by who knows who, but they were really affected that. And, and the only way to come out of this really to be able to engage and empower the young people in the region and be able to give them an opportunity, to give them the, the chance of being to participate and be part of shaping their future and be part of that decision making that happens there. And if that will take place clearly, uh, that will make a big difference because really this area has an opportunity for growth, has an opportunity for the economic development, we should be able to provide huge opportunity for all those young people throughout, throughout the region, and they can be really a source of stability. The thing that we, unfortunately, out those parts of the world, they think the instability of one country is, is, is good for them, uh, but really the instability of one country can be affected the others. 
if you look at one of the other issues, which is a very important problem in the, in the, in the, in the, the Arab Spring countries, uh, is the decline, the economic decline in, in those places. And if we'll have a collapse, economic collapse in one of these countries, really this will going to threat the whole stability for the whole region, and then it becomes completely out of control, and of course will affect the security not only in the North African countries, but everywhere in the world. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, I mean, uh, both uh, Mr. Falah uh, Musawa Bakr, I will pose the same question to you as well too, but I will also ask you the following because. Youth polls, economic unemployment, economic crisis, the people not being able to find a job. This has been like you know the major analysis of the region for quite some time. And the answer to this, you know, not necessarily democracy is like you know, people might argue that democracy is not necessarily needed in order to address this. You can perfectly, you know, address this question in different forms. And this brings the, me to the question of how the leaders or the elite of the Arab uprising understood the reasons of the people's frustration because it seems yes the former regimes was still prevalent and they expressed and they were very inimical yes the western intervention or the international powers did not undertake their responsibility but the question is did the elites or the leaders of these changes in the arab world understood exactly what people was demanding and were they like you know capable enough to deal with this? Because it seems like it's not only that the previous regimes and the regional status quo power or the international powers didn't understand the nature of the Arab uprisings, but the leaders or the elite of this uprising seems to be missed the point as well too. Uh, Mr. Minister, uh, yes, yesterday and the day before the discussion, one point was very striking. Whereas many people problematize the regimes, the government, uh, as the crisis, as the root crisis of, uh, as the root crisis in the region, but different was like some of the Kurdish participants problematize not only the regime but the state itself as well too, problematize the borders itself as well too, and you recently also had a referendum six seven months ago, and this referendum failed at least. I mean, or at least did not succeed. And this took place despite the warning of many quarters in the region, in the West, and also within the Kurdistan and Iraq as well too. So the question is two level. One of them is, why do you think is the state itself, not the political order or the political regimes as the problems? And secondly, if we have to holds the leaders and elite accountable as well too. The fact that with the referendum, to some extent, you failed your own people as well too. Because now what I see when engaging the people, you see the complete sense of disappointment. Then will we see an accountability mechanism that will take place with the regional elites as well too when responding to the people's aspiration and demands? Thank you, Ghalib, for the invitation, and I would like to thank uh, Al Sharq Forum and AMEC for the invitation, and also to hearing so many things about the challenges and the problems that we face in the Middle East and North Africa. But indeed, we have to be realistic. We should not stay at 30,000 feet high in the sky to discuss the problems of the Middle East. The problems of the Middle East are not only the regional superpowers, if I may call them, to sit down and discuss, ignoring the existence of the others. This is one of the main problems. When you deny the others, when you deny the existence of the others on the ground, whether they are sub-state actors, sub-national actors, or non-state actors. Talking about the region, we have to address this reality that the whole world lives in turmoil. So the world order has a problem in itself. Therefore, MENA region cannot be tackled in isolation if we want to address real issues on the ground. We have to be able to identify the problems, sit down together if we wanted a solution, and to try to prescribe a roadmap how to address them. Do we want solutions? Or do we want status quo to continue? Do we want problems and challenges to be part of our 
nature of daily life and live with it, or we want to put an end to these problems and come up with solutions that would bring about peace and stability. There are a number of issues that need to be dealt with. Sovereignty. Sometimes sovereignty is used for protection. Sometimes it's used for oppression. Where does it stand? We have to review the literature of the United Nations, etc. Identity, be that national identity, ethnic identity, religious identity, or uh, sectarian identity. Resources. Where do governments and states stand in terms of resources? Are they for some of the, the elite or the people? I've heard a lot about the people in the MENA region, but I personally do not believe that people come first. People in the MENA region come last. So therefore, we have to review and be realistic in addressing that, and not to be neither academic nor diplomatic, be realistic in addressing the issues, what are the problems and how can we get about a stage when we bring about peace and order and stability and prosperity. We have many challenges. We have the rise of terrorism, extremism, and fundamentalism. We have the problems of displacement, migration, asylum seekers, and also we have a continued state of denial. People, communities are denied their existence, denied their rights, and such kind of situation will not continue to lead to any solutions. People need to be respected and accepted accepted, respected, and included in the process if we were to have any inclusive and representative process. So that's why it would not lead it. We are dealing with some failed state in the region, maybe elsewhere in the world as well. But these, uh, some of them are failed, some of them are fragile, and some of them are in the wake of being so. What we see from the perspective of a subnational actor is that sometimes they just want to delay the process or deport the crisis into some other day, as if this is not my problem, let the next generation deal with that, and this is not a policy. The overall situation is at risk, with too many challenges. The tension between I Iran and the United States and what will come about on the 12th of May. Tension between Iran and Israel. Tension between Saudi Arabia and Iran. These are problems that will have ramification and it will impact our region. What would that lead to? The division which is there among the GCC. The status quo between Qatar and Saudi Arabia. And also in some other countries we see that there is war on terror, but at the same time there, are, there is internal fighting or more than an internal fighting, as it is the situation in Syria. In Iraq, the war on ISIS has ended as the Islamic State, but war on terror remains in Iraq. So it's not over yet. That's why we have to be realistic in dealing with this. Going back to Syria, the tension and the disagreement which is there between the United States and Russia has also an impact on what's going on and what will be the future. If governments, peoples, regional actors in the MENA region want to find the solution, then there has to be a collective security mechanism so that they all part, play a part in this, bringing about a security system that they feel it's their own. Maybe you last year you called it architecture, this time arrangements. Okay, it could be, for example, GCC to have a security of its own, an arrangement that would be specific or relevant to GCC. Another thing for another area, but after all, the, the MENA region need to have some arrangements that they all feel part of that strategy. In the absence of coordination and cooperation, then definitely there wouldn't be any stability. We have to deal with the reality that such kind of problems will continue and we have to deal with them as if it's the way of life. The Palestinian question, Israel and Palestine, has continued for 48 years. Do we want that to continue and add numbers to that and commemorate it? Or do we want to put an end to this and sit down with the main players and see where do we see a solution? The Kurdish question in the Middle East cannot be denied forever. It's a question, it's there, it needs to be addressed. By denying a problem, you cannot present a solution. Be realistic, sometimes you're talking at 
at a level that you don't see the real problems. Then it comes the issue of water, it comes the issue of natural resources, others and others. That's why let's define the problems, identify the challenges, and what would be the best mechanism to come up with solutions. We do understand that there are interests. Superpowers have their own interests, regional powers have interests, but also peoples and states have interests. Why shouldn't we sit down together and see where can we find a common ground? It's not impossible. Everything is possible if we are looking for a solution. But if we want to put or play the blame game, to blame governments, to blame state, non-state actors or others, then we would never find that solution. And we have seen, for example, some countries have used oil for the prosperity of their region or their country, their people, have used it for building and reconstruction. And they have brought prosperity. Others were not able to use it properly. They used it for militarizing the country, <coughs> used it for destruction, and this did not lead to uh, prosperity and stability. Therefore, we can count on resources to play an important role if that was dealt with properly and also there has been a fair distribution of the wealth. <clears throat> I believe we have to be honest with ourselves when we sit down together away from complementary statements, accept each other, and also to have a clear separation between state and religion. We are paying a price of that. A clear separation of religion and state so that we can have a democratic state or civilized states or modern states whatever you call it, because the issue of the border is something. If we were to assume or to lift and remove the boundaries and the borders and deal with peoples, can we find solutions for the MENA region? If the borders were the problem, let's assume for one day that these borders do not exist. Let's sit down as nations and as people to find solutions for them. Being honest, accepting each other, respecting each other, agreeing on the rights of all these communities, denying none, coming with solutions that would satisfy all the partners, I believe that would help some of the people to get rid of their superiority complex. Some see themselves in this region very superior, they, to a level that they don't even see the others. That's the problem, demonizing other people. We have to think about solutions that come voluntarily and not imposing their will on the others. Collective security or joint security, an integrated economy, and also putting people first would come up with a solution. As for the referendum that you mentioned, the referendum came as a result of the desperation and disappointment of the leader region that Baghdad did not abide by the constitution and the social bond that we have agreed upon. The people and leadership of Kurdistan region in 2003 went to Baghdad voluntarily to build a new country, a federal, democratic, pluralistic country, to build a system that would be inclusive, representative, that we would all be equal. What went wrong, what went wrong was the of this. And this is why we want to do that peacefully and through negotiation, but unfortunately, negotiation and our peaceful approach was rejected. And we had seen maybe in the question and answer, I think that was more. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I will both collect the question from the platform and you, all of you already have. But first, do you have any questions for each other? Any? Uh, if not, I will go to the platform. Who would like to ask the question? We have the gentleman in the last row. Yes, yes. Okay, Ustaz Dengor, and then gentleman. Uh, my question okay. to everybody is really is that. A soal, is there a clear vision of what people want? Is there a clear vision based upon values, based upon human rights, based upon worker rights that people can take for? Now, if we have divisions based upon sectarianism, based upon race, based upon clan, based upon tribe, 
and this is exploited to take forward uh, divisions and actually create a situation where it could be continuous instability, there would be no solutions. I Thank think you. what needs to come up is people with a common solution for the region, irrespective of race, color, creed, or gender. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, gentleman back there. Actually, uh, I'm, my name is Hossein al Zadeh from uh, Tampere Peace Research Institute in Finland uh, and visiting scholar in uh, Istanbul Shehir University. Uh, since this is my first time uh, attending to this uh, Sharq uh, Forum and uh, listening to the whole uh, uh, insightful uh, lectures, and looking at the title of the uh, mm. conference, Security Arrangements for the MENA region, mm -hmm. then I come to a very uh, important question in which, uh, uh, in which international system we are talking about. Uh, to whom you are addressing? Well, to all of them, each, and I don't know which one will address, but not bad uh, if somebody from Saudi Arabia or Iran will okay. address to this uh, question. Well, well still, still just have sure. Finish my point. Actually, um, uh, in 2009, Edward Lucas has published a book about the new Cold War. And recently, the uh, security, uh, general director of the United Nations also has, has said the world has stepped in new Cold War. If we don't understand what in the international system we are stepping in, then none of the question could be answered. What is the role of Iran? What is the role of Saudi Arabia? What is the role of the other countries or Turkey? Now Turkey is close to, uh, to Russia, is close to uh, Russia. So before everything, I would just want to uh, come up with this proposal that once somewhere in this uh, forum uh, to address that whether the world is stepping in the, uh, a new international system or not, then what is the role of each, each and every country? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there, yeah, here. Thank you, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Kashugi divided the region uh, into four groups. Uh, and I, the past two days, I was looking around me and I, we were discussing the security arrangements in the Middle East, and I couldn't uh, help but notice that you know, there's uh, no one from UAE. There is, uh, I, I apologize for not noticing, but no one from Israel, you know, someone from Saudi Arabia. That Istanbul. I don't suggest that this is by design, but it happened to be the case that regardless of the conditions that we were discussing, just by looking around, mm -hmm. I saw uh, another group of sorts. Uh, we had uh, Russians around, uh, Iranians, Turks, uh, Qataris, etc. So my question is, is there a different sorts of uh, 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 division going on here? Uh, maybe a There is no Qataris in the room. Okay, uh, maybe <laughs> involvement, uh, I don't know, maybe that, uh, that was my impression uh, somehow. Uh, I apologize for that, but in any way, is there a two-tiered Middle East uh, coming uh, uh, up with Russia, Turkey, uh, Iran on the one side, and maybe some neutral actor, uh, actors as well, and then the Saudi Arabia, Israel, Egypt, uh, UAE on the other side, uh, politically speaking? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another question was where? Okay, we can go to. Oh, sorry, there, there. Yeah. Yes, there. And then. I'll speak in Arabic. Uh, the arrangements, uh, security arrangements in the Middle East, uh, of course, means that there are countries which are, are going to arrange because Caius cannot arrange itself by itself. This is my first question to the speakers, brothers in Turkey, Iran, Saudi Arabia as well. This question is directed to you. Don't there? Isn't there a possibility of 
finding a way for those three countries to sit together in addition to Egypt. The four main pillars of the Middle East. They need to sit together and think about this issue. The question is why we are saying that such a possibility is not possible. Why isn't it possible for them to sit together? The framework of all the speech is the security arrangements. Within any scene, we need uh, to arrange the whole area and look at the future. There are three points of view. There are people who want to rearrange the area according to democracy. Others want to do this according to what is happening on the ground uh, uh, from the sectarian point of view. And the third uh, party is the one who wants the uh, old Arab order. We have three points of views, and each one has their own uh, evidence. Now, the arrangements in regard to security, uh, uh, which uh, perspective is going to be uh, used? Is it the democracy, or is it the admittance of the c conflict of the sect sects, or to keep the order as it is? I will be pleased if everyone have two minutes uh, responding to whatever question that they like from there, and the question that I pose as well to you. Well, let's start from the reverse order, Jamal Khashoggi. Right, I, I like the question about uh, two tier Middle East or uh, the, uh, why there is no one from UAE here or from. Even in the world of academia and research, we are becoming paralyzed. We are becoming in trenches. Many of the people here will not be invited to attend a conference for a research center in Abu Dhabi or in Riyadh, and vice versa. Uh, those divisions have moved even to us, and we began to take position along with uh, our leaders. Many of you here want to address the question, why don't we cooperate together? But this is not our role. I can go and speak for an hour. Kazim and I, we can stand here and say, the benefit of Iran and Saudi Arabia cooperating. Yes, there are benefits, but we are not cooperating because each country has a totally different vision for the Middle East. Each country is so doubtful of the other. Our role as a researcher is to take the reality as it is, not as it should be. Uh, we are not political leaders, where we give a speech uh, advocating or uh, uh, why it will be beneficial for uh, Turkey and Saudi Arabia and Iran to have uh, a grand summit and, and, and sort out all kind of the problems. Our role is to, to answer why Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and Iran cannot have that summit, cannot have that, uh, uh, th that arrangement, and explain why each country is so different from the other. Thank you. Just one thing. Uh, we did invite. I mean, uh, some even one accepted, but I don't know why it's left from Riyadh. But I guess, like, you know, when you go with con conditions, if Iranian participate, will not participate type of things, we would not have accepted this from Iranian as well, too, if they said, like, you know, if Saudi participate, will not participate. So it's not, diff it's not easy to get some, some people from some I think one of the questions is the, uh, <clears throat> what really the people want. I think, I think what the people want in, the, in all our countries and all over the world is exactly the same. They would like to live a good life, to raise their children. They have an opportunity to live in a freedom and to be able to be part of shaping the future. This is exactly the same everywhere. But how to implement that? How to be able to address it? Uh, if you look at the, the, the Arab Spring countries, and I talk about examine our country here, bring down a regime doesn't end the legacy of regime. Because 
when, when uh, you cannot, day one, be able to create this environment to be able to, be able to fulfill what their needs and will provide that. It will take some time. And also added to that complexity is the intervention that will continuously facing us in, in these regions to, uh, uh, to limit the ability for able to answer and to be able to move on forward with, with, with that. Uh, the other thing really, which is I think the answer, is, it, is there really this polarization? It is a, there is a polarization. It's polarization both internally and also with the alliances to the superpowers in the world, who they don't want to see this region to be united. And so, so clearly they're influencing it by all the means that they can. And of course, we still have countries uh, who really depend on their security on other nations who they have different agendas for them. I believe what lacks in the leadership is real leadership in the Middle East and the North Africa region is real leadership that shoulders the responsibility. Because with leadership comes responsibility. It's not a luxury. Because any decision made, it affects lives of millions of people. Therefore, after the referendum or post-referendum, we have seen Turkey, Iran, and Iraq sitting down together to address that issue, how to punish the people of Kurdistan region. We could have that together for the Kurds to have been invited to sit down together to find a peaceful solution, a solution that would have taken their legitimate concerns into account. What lacks in the Middle East is dialogue, is the means of communication. So therefore, today we are in the post-referendum era. Erbil is committed to dialogue. We are happy that dialogue has started. We are engaging with Baghdad on the basis of the Constitution. We hope that there wouldn't be intervention in Iraq if there is any to help and support Iraqis to find solutions to their problems. But unfortunately, regional interventions or interferences have been negative. That's why we, when we talk, we talk about international observers or international participants to share their technical expertise and help bring about solutions to these problems. We in the Kurdistan region of Iraq, we have started our journey of democratization. We don't claim that we're perfect, but we have come a long way. Therefore, we believe our commitment and our responsibility towards the people of the region. We hope that we, Erbil and Baghdad, have realized that the only way forward is to commit ourselves to the Constitution that we have all agreed upon and to put that in, in place so that it will be implemented to bring about stability, security, and prosperity. Iraq and Kurdistan region are both rich in resources, in human resources and natural resources, and we can secure a better future for all. Now the agreement is on a federal system to share the power and wealth. The future would determine what it will look like, but today this is our approach. Thank you. I think uh, many questions, many good points. Two minutes is too much. Uh, <laughs> but, but let me, uh, first of all, uh, bring uh, to the attention the uh, issue of methodology. We are talking about security arrangements in the region. We cannot be encyclopedic talking about every issue. We have to be systematic and focused. And I think here we have two approaches. One approach is to be somehow blocked in the current crisis, and especially go to a blame game and uh, you know, sense of victimization. But the second approach is, and try to solve each of these conflicts and then security arrangements. The second track is, yes, we have this crisis, we have these problems, in these challenges, but still thinking about security arrangements in the region is a possibility and is a necessity. If the second approach is accepted, which I think can be, because we cannot all solve the issues of current nature, and some of them are very chronic crises, so I think we have to be innovative. And here, my second point is, I think we cannot start by fixated assumptions, notions about different players, Everything here has its own dynamism. Syrian crisis, Arab state had its own dynamism during its course, as still it has, and I think all the actors. Uh, and I think here on the international system, the question that was asked, 
A part of the international system is made out of decision. So we are builder of international system. It's not that there is a fixated international system and then we act upon that, let's say, a frame. Because the dynamism, the making, the construction of the region and the world goes together. Look at Iranian, Russian, uh, Turkish cooperation in Syrian conflict. Yes, it's a conflict. It's a very difficult conflict. Uh, but uh, still out of the, let's say, most difficult uh, crisis, there is the possibility of cooperation. And I think even my final point on the vision, I, we cannot say there is no vision. We, can say, we cannot also say there is a clear vision. Vision also is having an evolutionary nature. So you draw the vision upon the dynamism of uh, realities on the ground. So my conclusion is, let's think about arrangements. Let's find concepts. Let's look at pockets. And let's political, create political will and not be blocked by the existing crisis and take our own agency, our own space of action, individually, institutionally, and nationally, and regionally, more seriously. Three quick points. Um, first of all, we're, we're facing an extraordinarily dangerous situation in the world at the moment. Uh, we've seen an uh, Arab state collapse in the Middle East. We've seen a very deep uh, polarization, civil wars, uh, regional crises. Um, we also see uh, total gridlock at the United Nations Security Council. Uh, Russia vetoes any resolution on Syria. The United States vetoes any resolution on Palestine, etc., etc. So. Um, there, there, is, there is no clear way, there's no international security system uh, that provides the context in which uh, uh, regional actors can, can uh, find, uh, try to find a, uh, a way forward. Uh, so that makes it particularly uh, difficult, but we need to find ways forward regardless in this dangerous situation and do the best we can. Uh, and dialogue is, 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 always has to be the basis for it. Uh, the um, second point is that um, uh, in Syria, uh, and this is in response to, to Gallup's uh, question, um, the way forward will have to, first of all, as a first step, have to agree, have, has to be based on some kind of uh, common ground between the United States and Russia. Uh, it is not going to solve the problem. Uh, the problem will never be solved without that. It's a, it's a necessary but insufficient condition uh, for resolving the situation. Syria. In the New York Times three days ago, in an op-ed, I, I argued that there are two areas of common ground between the United States and Russia and Syria. One is um, that the, the United States is no longer an active intervener in Syria, uh, except every so often. It has spoiling power, and it has shown that. It still has military power. It can use it as a spoiler, and it has done so in eastern Syria through the airstrikes and in other ways, whereas Russia is in the driver's seat. Um, Russia needs uh, Western, uh, the Western, uh, the United States in particular, not to spoil if it wants to stabilize Syria and have a political transition that it likes, as opposed to what the West wants. Um, and so there has to be some level of cooperation there. Uh, the second uh, area of common ground is that it's not in the interest of either the United States or Russia to have a, uh, a hot war, a fighting war between Israel and Iran that's triggered in Syria. Um, and so there can be uh, some coordination. Uh, Russia has good relations with all the key actors. The United States does not. But again, the United States, uh, as a backer of Israel at least, uh, can play a positive role with Russia, supporting Russia, in trying to prevent, in a proactive way, uh, a, a hot war between, uh, between these two other actors, regional actors. My third point is about this conference, and uh, because the fact of the reason, the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that the region is deeply polarized, and it is very difficult for anyone in the region to organize a conference where everybody is included. Uh, there are some, uh, but this is outside the region. Uh, but I think the UCLA effort is still fairly inclusive. I run a, come across uh, people from from different countries uh, and and uh, political groupings. 
not, it's not, it's not completely inclusive, but it's, it goes some ways. It's really unfortunate that for many of you who are here today, you cannot even go back to your, I mean, Jamal cannot go back to Saudi Arabia, for example. That's terrible. Um, for those of you who, who are able to travel, and I, I make a point of going to every single country in the region to attend conferences in every one of them, to those of you who still can, please continue to do it because it is the only way to keep the channels of dialogue open in those cases where it's shut for other individuals. It's really important to, to continue the dialogue and to, uh, and to keep the communication going. Well, thank you. Yes. Um, uh, regarding the question why Turkey, um, Iran, or Saudi Arabia do not come together and discuss, I think there are some contacts between these countries, uh, not, not, not maybe on trilateral level, but they are coming together in different occasions, <coughs> on different occasions and discussing these issues. And there are uh, also some steps taken by different countries in terms of decreasing the tension. But on the other hand, we are in a very polarized environment. It is not very feasible for the timing, in my understanding, without addressing the real uh, challenges, real security fears of different countries, we cannot have a kind of uh, understanding among the regional players uh, about their spheres of influence or respective uh, national interests. I think it will take some time and also discussions to reach some kind of agreement on these issues. Uh, regarding Galip's question on the uh, challenges or stability or transformation, still from Turkish point of view, uh, the transformation should be supported, continued to be supported. But on the other hand, as nation states, you also have to address the security challenges emanating from your neighborhood. And in that regard, Turkey is still uh, supporting and, and uh, believing in the advance of democratization in the region, also transformation in the region. But on the other hand, protecting its national security interest in its uh, neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. With this, we are coming to end and to the first session. Uh, we'll have a 15 minutes of break. There will be coffee break outside. But afterward, uh, at 12 o'clock, we are starting the next session. The state and non-state uh, actors in the Middle East session will take place here. The second one, the traditional actors and new players in the region will take one floor up. It's the lobby, uh, lobby floor level. So it will take place uh, there. So there will be like two groups. So please try to be like, you know, on time as much as possible, and thank you very much again.